Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 492 with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time tuning into a show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash the like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below, any thoughts, feelings and suggestions. And of course, if you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review. I've seen many of you have left them already. It only takes a couple of minutes for you to do so. Click on your podcast app and leave me a five-star review. Help me get up the algorithm charts. I just generally let people know that you're enjoying the show. That'll be more than appreciated and then of course support via patreon is also welcome too you can find the description in the show links or the, find the description in the why do i keep always saying that mess up like that you can find a link in the description of the show on youtube and via any of the podcast players that you use out there the link is patreon.com for slash agostino that's patreon.com for slash a g o s t i n h o subscribe on there for as little as one dollar one pound per month you can access all my bonus content so make sure you jump on it don't delay get involved today at patreon.com Patreon.com, Fortress Agostino for bonus content of the Agostino Zinger Show. You get bonus content on there every week. I'm preparing a post this week, so definitely make sure you tune in and get involved. Don't delay. You won't want to miss it. But hey, here we are, back onto the main podcast, and I hope you are well wherever you may be. I've just come back from a very, very late run. I usually try and get my runs in early in the morning, but you know, as life is, sometimes things get thrown up in the middle. You just got to make do with what you have. And you know, most usually I, I prefer to. I much prefer to kind of delay or push back my workouts and just miss them completely. I try not to miss two days a week or I try not to make, I try not to miss two days consecutively, which I've done this week. So I've kind of had to, you know, I had no choice but to delay it because I couldn't miss a third. I've already broken one rule. I can't break another one. So um, I just delayed it and it was fine. But I am feeling way more tired than I usually felt, you know, towards the end of the night, you know, towards the end of the night, yeah, you feel tired, you feel fatigued, but you don't feel like workout fatigue. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't really be feeling like that unless, of course, you're doing two a days. But usually I find when I'm doing two a days, if I'm like, what, you know, if I'm going to work out in the morning, go, go run in the afternoon, I'm generally not that tired. You, I think your body adapts to it pretty quickly. Your body starts to realize, okay, cool, you want to do this thing, so we're gonna, you know, what we're gonna do what we need. To, we're gonna do what needs to be done physiology, 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 physiology wise, or philosophically. Yeah, so philosophically, physiology wise, to ensure that you don't get yourself injured. And usually, for the most part, I've usually um, not been injured when I've done two days, which is odd, isn't it? You think usually when you do two days, you really are going to be more injured, but I think because you're usually quite fatigued, or maybe you're not as you know sprightly on your toes, you tend to kind of you know um focus more on your technique especially if you've been injured before because i've been injured before so you've got that ptsd in the back of your head and then when you do a second session and you're a bit tired your body tells you hey you don't want to put that you don't want to get into a bad shape or into a bad form because that's going to lead you to do x y z and z you know what i mean so that's pretty good oh yeah i've got to mention as well so i think i'm not sure i've not weighed myself yet. i got weighed myself at the end of the week but i think i've lost quite a bunch of weight at the moment because on that friday just gone i was able to wear my jeans which i haven't been able to wear the entire flipping lockdown and very they weren't the loosest they've ever been usually when i wear them they're quite baggy and these times they kind of looked a bit like skinny jeans on the thighs but still i was able to wear them and i probably stretched them in that respect but you know i had to kind of you know change up my outfits because i've been wearing the same all black outfit the entire lockdown because i didn't really have anything else that fit and i refused to buy anything new that's i think the key to me personally i guess because i'm quite shallow and because i care about fashion and i like to look good um and i like to you know put together cool outfits and shit and whatnot and show out a bit i tend to kind of be a little bit more strict on myself or hard on myself when it comes to putting on weight and working out and because i generally do enjoy working out too it makes it easy because i think you're probably you know inside of me i'm definitely an idiot i'm definitely a, a, there's definitely a fat kid inside of me screaming you know every time i pick up a salad or i walk past a flipping tray of croissants you know what i mean for sure um it's definitely in there um but obviously those other things are, are far more important in my life you know what i mean looking good in clothes and being able to i don't know club all day and all that stuff i, I enjoy more so I, I kind of in my head make a decision okay cool i'm gonna i'm gonna sacrifice the donuts so i can go out three days in a week or i'm gonna sacrifice this so i can put on that jacket you know what i mean it's a weird thing but you know we've all got our things so with that in mind i think another key thing as well that i tend to always do that i don't really i've only kind of realized now that might be a good solution is that if i do end up putting up on a bit of pounds which i haven't really in a long time i think i was probably at my lightest before lockdown i think i was about at the moment i'm gonna guess i haven't weighed myself yet but i'm gonna guess i'm probably like 250 240 pounds right which might be about i don't know what is that let me get on my calculator because I think before lockdown, if I'm not mistaken, 
I was probably, no, I was probably, I was around, so you say pounds wise, right? So at the moment, it, let's say I'm probably 250 at, to be to be safe estimate, which is about 113 kilograms, which is what else do people use here? Stone, which is about uh, 17 stone, whatever. Anyway, that's what people use, right? They use kg and whatever, right? So yeah, I'm about 250 pounds, right? Before lockdown, that was 2020 February when I went to Berghain last um, I was about 20, 220. I'm definitely about 220. Because I remember I fit in into everything. Everything was quite baggy. So, so I was about 99 kg, um, right? At, at that time, 220. But my lightest, of course, at the beginning of, tw no, the end of 2019, I was definitely around the 200 mark. So I kind of put on maybe 20 pounds within that year. But it was a good 20 pounds because I was lifting a lot. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't stuff that was making me not fit into clothes. It was just stuff I was making my t-shirts maybe fit a little bit tighter, which I would much prefer. But one of the things that I definitely think really helps me in my weight loss in general is that I never ever go out and buy fat clothes, like or fatter clothes, the clothes that are the size that I'm getting into. I have some clothes that I can I can fit into that you know will um, accommodate that size that I put on. But I never go out and buy like a full wardrobe, you know, like you know bigger pants. But no, I won't do it. I'd rather just wear my, I'd rather just wear the clothes that were bag on me when I was skinnier. And have them be tight on me then go out and wear those kind of i mean I, i'm just not gonna do it my brain just can't handle it and i think that's what helps because then you, you can't invest into a new wardrobe you have to wear what you have in your wardrobe already but you can't fit in it so then you only push to working out and then of course the other benefit also with that is that i'm working remotely or people are working from home from home most of the time so you don't have to go to work so you don't actually have to buy a new outfit you can basically just wear pajamas and stuff at home and you're perfectly fine so that really helps with the thing but i'm really happy man i'm so proud of myself that i did it i, I knew i was gonna do it anyway it's nothing to really be super proud about and kind of begin myself pat on the back i was always going to achieve that thing like i said i'm super shallow and I, and I love fashion so that was always going to happen i was definitely going to ensure that i was a size that would permit me to wear the things i want to wear when i go out and it's weird too because it's only when i want to go out clubbing and stuff that i want to wear this stuff because you know where else am i going to go so that's been a pretty deep revelation so i'm i think i'm down to I'm going to weigh myself to the end of this week, but I think I'm about 250. I think so. The last time I weighed myself, I was 260. I think the heaviest during COVID, I was like 280, which was nuts. And well, what's 280? 280 during COVID. You could probably see it in a podcast episode from like, from like the time, from like, if you look back at like an episode from like 2020, like early 2020, like January, and then you skip all the way to like 2021, you'll definitely see a big difference. Um, so yeah, I was about 220, which is about 220 pounds, which was about 127 kg back then. Now I'm probably about 250. So I think I probably lost about 30 pounds. And then hopefully by the end or the beginning of October, when I plan to go oh, at the end of October, no, you say beginning of October, when I plan to do sober October, and then at the beginning of November, when I plan to go to Berghain, I'm definitely going to be around the 200 mark. That's the, that's the plan. Do you know what I mean, really about the 200, maybe 210 mark. I definitely want to get there because, you know, why not? It's just good to kind of try to get yourself down to a shape or to a size that you haven't had before, see how it feels and then work your way up. I think in general, my work, my walking weight should be 220. I think that's where I kind of sit tight. Mm, 210, 220 is my walking weight. I can I can live within those margins. The moment it gets into about the 230 mark, it gets a bit frisky. I've been 190 before. I didn't like how it fit my body. I think my head's just too big for that kind of size i probably have to fill out a bit more muscular wise and if i want to be a 190 but i just don't like like the way my head looks it makes my head look way too bigger than what it should look on my body but still um you know let's stick at the 200 gang in it so i've still got a bit a bit of way to go still got about 50 pounds to lose but i'm happy i'm on my way slowly getting there clothes are starting to fit a little bit more looser i don't feel like i'm gonna rip everything when i'm wearing it you know it's just it's just a whole new world you know what i mean a whole new world so now when i when you see me out and that i'm not gonna just be in all black because all black is usually a sign that i'm feeling a little bit fat so if i'm able to wear co colors it's definitely a good sign man but i'll probably go back to all black stuff anyway because what more to go about you know I, mean? I love wearing all black man every time I, most of the times i've been to fold or i've been to like the cores and stuff I've been head to toe in black looking like a bouncer you know what I mean bomber jacket you know jumper t-shirt everything black 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 all the way down or I'll just spice it up and have like some colorful underwear or socks or something but you know we do what we do with the things that we have available man but yeah that, that, that's where I'm at that's where I'm at with the weight journey that's where I'm at so I'm also thinking about a way to talk about this slowly oh yeah talking about some raving over the week I've been obviously checking out some videos i guess because obviously going to fabric and being out and about these last couple of weekends has been awesome and i have to be honest like maybe it's just me and it's a uk stuff and we're so lucky i think i've been reading some things about you know the uk being one of the one of a small number of places in europe i'm not sure how many it is i'm gonna say maybe us 
let me say, is, does, does, does Kiev count as Europe or does Ukraine, Ukraine? Do you count as Europe? I guess you would, right? But I'm trying to think of, there's not many places in Europe at the moment where you can go and club, right? I'm not sure if you can still go clubbing in Ibiza. I'm seeing people going out in terrace bars. Can you actually go to an actual nightclub? I don't know. Um, or doing out of open air stuff. I've seen, you know, Seth Chocolate do some open air sets and stuff. I don't know if you go inside a club. But from indoor wise, I know that the UK is open. I know that parts of Ukraine and Russia are open because people are playing there all the time. It's a really good um, Instagram account called Soul Vibes where they just basically capture those videos of people playing in those amazing outdoor kind of terrace venue places. So that's open. And there's some indoor ones too, don't get me mistaken. Um, so it's your should. The, the well, it's Holland obviously closed. I think they're gonna reopen in November. Germany's just about opening up now, just a few places. And I don't know who the other one is. Maybe, yeah, maybe France, right? Maybe France, I'm not too sure. But there's not a lot of places. So I am feeling in t incredibly grateful that we are able to go out and rave. And maybe it's just a age thing, or maybe it's an experience thing, maybe it's the lockdown. I don't know what it is, but. I'm just pumped, man. I'm like, I like, I like just hanging out and just listening to stuff, right? The last couple of times I've been, I've just been sat, stood against the wall, just vibing, just it, just vibing, catching the catching the vibe, you know, um, just standing next to everyone's ambiance. You know what I mean, absorbing everyone's ambiance. It's been a vibe. I don't know what it, I don't know what it is. And and again, I think in years gone by, I definitely would have seen the club as an opportunity just to go get myself absolutely wrecked. Do you know what I mean? I'd be in the toilets like every five minutes. I'd be drinking all the time. And it was, again, maybe it was a more of an escape. It's because of the stuff that I was going through in my normal life day to day. But in general, I think I'm enjoying clubbing more than I have done in a long time. Really, really bizarre feeling. Probably the reason why that I'm not really so rushy rushy to go head over to berlin was i was before because i think that again that was another reason to kind of go and escape the woes of my everyday life here in the uk so because of that i'm enjoying what we have available here in london i'm enjoying what we have available here in the uk i'm hopefully going to do a couple of trips to some places outside the uk too to go visit some other places and see other people playing other venues that'd be awesome and obviously i'll report back on the channel but yeah man i'm feeling invigorated i'm not going to lie i'm feeling rather invigorated um the scene is good it's a good vibe. It's a strange one. Um, you know, I think someone made a point the other day about, um, you know, in Fabric that maybe the lack of tourists has maybe affected it a little bit, but it's the vibe is just interesting. You know, it's an interesting vibe because the the world is kind of really being put on pause and parts of the world are not open and you're not allowed to travel in certain places and you, only if you got the money and if you do have the money, that's, you know, everyone's basically paying a, an equivalent of like 300 pounds to 500 pounds either way to come to the country when you include the pcr test and all that stuff beforehand so it's not it's, it's not a, it's not a, like a a cheap trip it was well, not now at the moment it probably will be later on so because of that the clubs are really interesting right they're interesting mix of people we, we've obviously generally lost a lot of like average punters i think people underestimate how many how much the average punter adds to the bottom line of clubs of course tourists too but i think just the average everyday punter just strolls in because they want to just check out the viable they realize that this is the only place that opens until six those people as well are really crucial um to kind of filling out clubs and you're seeing a lot of that isn't really happening which is why some of the bigger acts are the ones that are only really selling tickets it looks like all the other smaller kind of acts are kind of really struggling to move any tickets for any kind of event really um but but the vibe is still good for, as a raver as a person just kind of going to have a good time and to kind of shake your bum bum and you know move to the rest left to the right it's definitely something that i would encourage people to do now this is definitely the best time to go to, to go to a club if, if you wanted to not be harassed and you wanted to just catch a vibe and see what it's like this is definitely the best time to go before the flood gets open and the world reopens up for sure go now so that being said, um, I stumbled across a couple of sets I've been playing or that I kind of ripped off of YouTube and converted to MP3 and then put that onto my iTunes and then put it onto my phone. Um, these two sets from Boiler Room, number one set being from this um, girl called Anne, who I wasn't less that familiar with prior. Um, wasn't really familiar with her DJing pr um her DJing repertoire, or DJ repertoire, what you call it? Her DJing ability, let's say, for that regard. And I only stumbled across this stream because there was a link that was on Twitter of Bless Madonna playing the same set. And then I saw a link of Benji B playing on there. And he was, you know, I skipped one bit where he was playing Amma Piano. And my set, a part of my soul just died seeing someone like a Benji B play Amma Piano. Jeremy is like, oh my God, they're going to gentrify this music already, in it? I can already see it, but I can already see it. I was just like, God, no. What next? Fucking, fucking 
Deborah DeLuca playing in the middle of Naples somewhere. I just can't. Please, just let let us have it for a bit, and then you can have it later on in it. They did the same thing to Funky House, and they're gonna kill this as well. But anyway, let's story for another day. But yeah, this girl and um, she absolutely destroyed. And again, I think maybe my standout set from what I saw on the stream. Again, I wasn't there at the event. It's a boiler room event. I'm sure it probably felt different being there. Um, but she definitely had the standout set, and you would hope, you would imagine, she probably, you know, the pay structure or the fee that she gets according to in comparison to something like a blessed madonna is very drastically different obviously because blessed madonna's obviously been in it longer she probably sells more tickets blah, blah blah but this is why it's a good example why i think spots like but yeah this is yeah this is why i think this is why i think spots like boiler room are important because there's an argument to be said earlier or later on i'm going to talk about this topic where people have been speaking about um something on business the business techno instagram account where they're basically saying that how all the boiler room are exploiting their artists by not paying them or it's malarkey and i don't really necessarily agree that i honestly do think it was only actually i only really learned of it recently i didn't know that boiler room didn't pay their artists i just assumed that everyone got a, a flat fee or something i didn't know it was they just didn't pay no one which is interesting but hey we continue but i still don't think it's a big deal i still think boiler room's platform and what they're able to produce or what they're able to provide for the dj has far more value outside of monetary than they could ever do for them paying a fee i think so and again someone like an ans who i think was maybe the standout dj set on this night has the opportunity to have people like myself stumble on her set because she's playing alongside the blessed madonna on the same lineup do you know what i mean so because of that i'm gonna watch her and then she's gonna have loads of little viral moments because as you see with this video that i'm gonna pop on the screen in a moment is like cool dancers in the background she's obviously playing amazing she looks great behind the decks the sound is good they're catching funny people in the crowd do you know what i mean all this stuff adds to it and that virality online is definitely going to end up getting her probably more bookings or more interest or just some new fans do you know what i mean and that i think is a benefit that you can't really match monetarily i don't think especially when it comes to live streaming a show like this you know what i mean i don't really know like i'd hate to know how much it costs for a boiler room to put on their events just to live stream fair enough it's different now because the technology is far more improved than it did when they first started in what was it 2010 or whatever it was i can definitely understand that now the argument could be like oh anyone can do this you just need obs okay cool but still they are fronting it do you know what i mean they're fronting it they're putting it out they're kitting it out for the most part uh, with the exception of a couple of djs who you know spill drink with a couple of sets where someone spills a drink on the deck or something i haven't really seen too many boiler rooms where there's been a lot of tech issues for the most part it sounds perfect you get the dj playing in a great space you know they get to play for in front of a cat in a rapturous audience a bit of a random one because the tickets are free and all you gotta do is sign up but still a rapturous one not regardless and i think for sure um and hopefully we'll get a lot of love from this set because i definitely thought it was one of the stronger ones in this um whole thing and i think there was a bit in the set as well that i want to play for you guys here i've got up here on the screen i think it was about 39 minutes in it around here where was it yeah it was around here probably one of the best little parts of the set gives you a vibe gives you a kind of a little bit of a feel of what it was like to be there let's just go back here actually where these girls are because they absolutely smashed it with their choreography let's go from here so this is Anne's playing at boiler room london um recorded on september the 4th 2021 i'll post a link in the description so you can check it out yourself but definitely a standout set that i've been listening to in the gym for the last couple of days <laughs> Don't you like don't don't you have to just love and adore club spaces or just places where DJs play electronic music because there's legitimately nothing tying those people behind the DJ, right? In terms of what they look like, right? If you could judge a book by its cover and kind of, you know, um uh what you call it make up what they're into who their friends are where they go where they hang out where they work the kind of stuff that they read or watch or listen to there's not much that kind of ties them together apart from their love for electronic music isn't it that's how amazing it is the amount of people the different types of people it brings together it's just absolutely fantastic it really really is in this paper look at this girl smashing it so good Come on. 
Come on, son. <laughs> so 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 good honestly so so good definitely check it out give Anz a listen um one of my standout sets one of my standout sets then another one that i want to mention from the boiler room this is at the what is it ampere open air is a guy called david vunk again another argument for why i think boiler rooms non or refusal to pay dj fees or you know preference to basically tell them it's better it's more of an opportunity that's what i'm gonna say Boreham is one of the only places, you know, some people say, oh, yeah, it's, you know, when you're doing freelancing, creative sort of work and they're like, oh, we don't have a budget, but there's opportunity in it. The opportunity is the kind of, you know, the monetary value that they're ascribing to it. They're, hey, you get a chance to be in this magazine. It's read by a thousand people. It's usually always fluff and it's usually air. They should usually pay you because they're paying other somebody else for the most part. Right. So you definitely should go in there and ask for your coins. But there are some rare occasions where sometimes just doing the thing for free and not even asking for a, for a fee, not even asking to be you know reimbursed monetarily can actually serve you in the long term and i think this is a good example of it when it comes to david vunk again i'm sure this is somebody a lot of the heads know i think if i'm not mistaken i think he's dutch um and whatnot but i don't really know the guy um it looks like he's an absolute beast on the festival circuit you don't really see him getting booked in many clubs maybe because he doesn't want to go but he seems to be an absolute madman when it comes to the festival circuit he's always traveling somewhere he's always doing mad dates all over the place i think again we lose we lose the ability to find out about David Vunk because we don't have the resident advisor DJ poll thing anymore because some DJs got too butthurt about you know, being ranked really low in the, in the thing or something. It's just annoying. I don't understand why that got rid of, why they got rid of that. It's such a, it's such a like, um, you know, it's such a, an occasion where you're cutting your nose off to spite your face sort of thing. It didn't make any sense because one of the great things about the resident advisor DJ poll, even though maybe like, let's say the top 50 might have been gamed or whatnot, still you had the option of finding many people under the top 50 from 50 to 100 who were amazing. And also if you went to the comments, comments, sorry, there'll be loads of people recommending people who they like liked, who they saw when they went out somewhere. And because there was an upvote system, you had people just like, you know, writing lists of loads of amazing local DJs they saw play or someone they saw playing some random festival in Georgia and then the random person can be like oh yeah I remember that he or she and they can upvote your comment and usually you'd find out that there were amazing lists that were put together in the comments that were probably far better than the list that was created by the resident advisor sorry by the DJ poll right that was obviously public but in general one of the good things about a DJ poll you've got to find some you know some little nuggets of surprise I think that's how I discovered like MCDE Motor City Drum Ensemble based on one of the resident advisor DJ polls so you get to find people that you probably wouldn't have found because you think oh how, why is he a number 40 who's this guy and then you click on the thing you hear what it sounds like blah 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 and i think we lose that discoverability so one of the great places to get that kind of discoverability and to kind of put yourself in front of people is to go on these live streaming platforms and boiler room is a great example of this and david vonk is another example because again i'm sure he's a local hero i'm sure on the festival circuit he slays and people know who he is but i had no idea who this guy is before i saw a video of him performing on boiler room and this is another ex example again of why that space is so good and also Boy david vonk himself he's got this when it comes to style and technique of DJing, he's got this really interesting technique that he does where he doesn't necessarily, he's not the most technical when it comes to mixing. You know, I went to see flipping um, Jeff Mills the other day and that was a real lesson and a reawakening in what people can and should do behind the decks if they have the ability to, especially with modern day technology. Like he's legitimately reconstructing, reconstructing songs behind the decks. Like he's basically doing Ableton and whatnot live, right? Improv using fucking vinyl. It's absolutely insane what he's doing. Looping stuff, cutting stuff, bringing stuff here, bringing stuff there. It's absolutely masterful how he does it. Absolutely masterful, I swear to God. And it was really, 
eye opening to see. But there's also something to be said for other people, like you know, I think of someone like a DJ Harvey, for example. They're not the most technically gifted DJs in terms of like being able to cut and do all these mad stuff with the effects and loops and whatnot. But what they do have ability is to is to kind of blend stuff in together, or maybe have what David Vunk does is that he has the, probably the best sequencing I've seen, like the in terms of like knowing what comes next and not kind of throwing stuff off with certain tunes. I think that's where Dixon kind of comes into his own as well that ability to kind of have a flow in his set and obviously maybe it comes from the fact that he's played longer sets before in his history blah blah i don't really know but regardless david bunk's mixing style is quite basic right he kind of waits for the breakdown waits for the end of the chorus maybe loops a bit here and then kind of brings in the second tune pretty hard and aggressive he doesn't really wait around for it but i think more so it's a sequencing that he's able to do and obviously the fact that he's one of the best showmen behind the decks like you know if you're a fan of the you know the patrick the, the patrick masons of this world and stuff and people that actually look like they're having fun behind the decks apart from looking all sad and dour i definitely recommend you check out david vunk and this is a set of his playing at the what's it called the um, ampiri open air i think it's also about 12 minutes here where he absolutely slays i'm gonna play a bit of you now come on son <laughs> See how the other track just comes in, aggressive. Yo, this is like choppy as hell, isn't it? Let me just see if I can knock down the settings a bit. It's being super choppy. Maybe we've got too many things loaded up. Let's get to 480 and see what happens. Boom, 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 boom. That's better. Nice. Yeah, see, style wise, it's quite. And then sex songs come in, but it's still, the vibe is still being kept. But he's such a great showman behind the decks, you know what I mean? He's having fun, he's dancing, interacting with the crowd. leave it there that's david vunk at the ampere open air definitely one of my standout sets that i've seen on the interwebs and like i said um the vibe is back man it looks like the vibe is back that's maybe one of the better crowds i've seen um playing or someone playing for in, uh, on boiler room usually they're a little bit dour and a little bit you know reserved and in themselves but it looks like everyone's really happy to be out um being able to touch faces touch elbows arms shoulders knees and toes and they're having a whale of a time they're having a whale of a time so let's jump right on into this business techno thing that i was mentioning teasing a lot about boiler room that i probably hmm, would be the only person that probably doesn't agree with but this is basically where it started from this so this is um where is it um yeah so this is what, so this is it let's start with this one. I think this is the one that started it all off so this is courtesy of the business techno page aka business techno who were basically at the forefront of you know of the scene or the movement kind of revealing and exposing some of the more affluent djs out there who were playing these um somewhat play graves around the place at the beginning of the at the of the pandemic that really didn't make any sense it was kind of making people scratch their heads i thinking why is nina kravitz going to play this random party somewhere in the desert where people are dancing inside of hula hoops when she's you know gets paid like 30 grand per set to play in every other place like it's not like you need the money i mean it's not like you're hurting for the money 
So people didn't even understand it. Again, um, you know, I'm not one to pocket watch or anything, but it just seemed a bit strange. So they were doing some great work in that regard. I think that going on and on about Playgraves nowadays is a bit redundant, in my opinion. Um, I think you should just move on, really, for the work for the most part. I think the people that want to go to Playgraves will all go. The DJs, DJs that want to, yeah, the DJs that want to play will go regardless if they get shamed because you're getting money at the end of the day. No one's going to turn down a paycheck because somebody said something mean to them on Twitter on Instagram. That's just not sensible to think about, like, to think of about the world like that. The people that go to the play graves also don't care and probably don't even know what business techno even means. So they're just going to go because they want to have a great time. And for the most part, it doesn't really affect anybody that's basically complaining about it i think the people that are that are living in those towns and those countries are more worried about keeping their families safe than what some rich people are doing in some airbnb in the mountain somewhere they don't give a fuck or i'd imagine they probably have bigger things to worry about so i do think it's a little bit of a virtue signaling thing that people are doing to kind of make everybody aware of what's going on and makes people know that they are on the right side of history quote unquote it just gets a little bit redundant i just think people should move on if anything it should it would be nice to get to place where you know maybe some of the people that were playing these mad events where they left a trail of bodies and flipping you know sky high numbers could maybe face some repercussions but there is there has not been any repercussions um most of the people that play those events are getting are booked and busy still in normal clubs around the world so no repercussions from the scene or industry has basically come into it so what more do you want us normal partners to do, do you know what i mean if the scene doesn't care why should we as customers what can we do because no one else cares i mean they keep getting booked in places people keep attending their things so just move on so it looks like they've now turned their eyes towards the resident advisor thing and boiler room thing the resident advisor thing i get because i think the understanding is that they got some funding from um the government here in the uk a pretty large amount of, of grants um you know they promised to do a lot of things in response to the whole blm movement in america with the death of george floyd r.i.p and maybe some of those promises haven't been followed through and all that stuff i get there's definitely some reasons behind that um but the boiler room thing is where i kind of you kind of lose me a little bit in my opinion but hey what do i know so this tweet here on the instagram page says the following saw a tweet months ago where someone said resident advisor and boiler room are the masters of finessing funding and we haven't stopped thinking about it for a second since i don't necessarily think that's a big revelation i think anybody that tries to get government funding is essentially financing it for the most part right you are maybe um you are maybe embellishing some of your claims, you know, maybe uh, propping up some of your achievements on numbers and stuff so that you can secure funding in order to empower others or to provide a platform for other people to do some stuff or to give back to people. I don't know. You're doing it for some ulterior kind of um what, what's i would call for some altruistic reasons of course so you kind of forgive yourself for painting a few white lies but i think everyone does that. i don't think that's con just kind of reserved on if you're an advisor in a boiler room i would imagine so it says do boiler room and the resident advisor pay their artists now the resident advisor paying the artists i don't know what they want to pay them for maybe for, for the when they put on those shows and stuff that might be a good thing to say i think for sure if boiler room so if as an advisor are putting ads up on their site and then they're selling tickets to an event and not paying people to come and perform, that's obviously some sick shit. But when it comes to boiler room, I generally do think the platform that they provide for people far exceeds any sort of monetary fee that they can attach to. I really do. I look at the likes of who's a, that, that DJ, um, the one that went viral because some guy pulled up her tune. And, uh, was it Cheryl Shirill? Yeah, is that you pronounce her name? Cheryl Shirill, that girl. Um, part of the reason why you know she's as big as she is now is because of that viral clip yes of course it might have been a very distressing occasion to go through having some stranger pull up your your tune i think he was a fellow dj too if i'm not mistaken anyway it doesn't matter but that negative positive press that she got from that it, you know catapulted her career to where she's at now at the moment where i think recently i've read something that she decided her own label or she's got like a mentorship program or something now you know just doing the damn thing she's on the bbc or channel 4 talking about djing and going out and lockdowns i don't know so she's obviously all over the place that that did well for her even somebody like a blessed madonna formerly known as black madonna back then when that clip of her went viral where she's absolutely you know knocking the socks off that mixer that was obviously a bit thing that that it, that was obviously a video that people are using to kind of inst you know take the piss out of her and whatnot but still i would say that kind of increased her profile and definitely maybe she could you can't really say it has any direct correlation to her bookings but i'm sure the increased profile might have helped some way along the line um you think of somebody like a jada g um jada, a, jada g might be a good one i forgot what what 
but what Deck Mantle said that was that she played that boy and recorded where everyone was like, oh my God, she's so attractive. Oh my God, she can mix some vinyl. She's amazing, right? And people went nuts for that. And of course, she's probably feeling a little bit conflicted about having people, you know, basically objectify her in that way. But, you know, what can we do? So those people, you know, that, that I just mentioned, their, their careers catapulted off the ability to play on that sort of platform and have the ability to connect with thousands, if not hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world and to showcase your talents. And, you know, the, the reality of it is that DJs aren't that special, right? That's the reality. And I speak of it, I speak as a DJ myself, having been in this game for 10 plus years as a promoter and a DJ, you're not that special. Do you know what I mean? Like they're 10 a penny, anyone and, and anyone and their mum can learn pretty quickly. If you have a good taste, in music you definitely kind of separate yourself from the pack but for the most part DJs are 10 a penny and if anything the options for them to pick in terms of artists are wide right and the fact that they're giving some of these people a platform to play on their on their stage um, especially in the early days when it wasn't really easy to live stream um, it definitely goes a long way I think I would I would hate to know how much of it, it money it takes to even run Boiler Room's operation right because they hire a hell of a lot of staff probably too many staff I think probably because even when you look at the before but the pandemic you look on their kind of job openings page and they always are hiring all over the place right from hosts to people working in the background room back office and stuff like it's just insane so that takes up a lot of money as well i'd assume probably not enough to justify not paying anyone a penny but still i think the idea that you know the the platform isn't as much worth than the fee is probably not right not right i don't think i think people are looking at it a little bit wrong in that respect um it probably would be beneficial if they could play a flat rate like similar to like you know some what's it Bergen's example there's other super clubs who just pay people a flat rate or maybe they play in terms of tiers that might be a good way to go and do it but in general i generally do think this is one of the rare occasions where the opportunity is far exceeds any other monetary fee you might get for doing the thing yourself i honestly do think especially if you can grab it by the balls um you can actually go and then perform show out impress people and people will really kind of you know i think end up following you for the long run i think in my opinion but again maybe i'm wrong in that respect and then the next screenshot another one we've got uh bok bok here saying just hearing about boiler and receiving 800k funding and then firing everybody if that is that true um i'm not sure if that is true i guess that is Ain't a friend and firing everybody. Um, maybe the 800k went toward paying debts that they accumulated during the entirety of the pandemic. If there's anything that definitely suffered more or worse, maybe than clubs, definitely was boiler room because half of their operation, I would imagine, maybe over half centered around being able to rock up into different venues or locations around the world, right? Be able to move around, fly stuff out, artists and whatnot, and not be able to do that it must have absolutely decimated their business. So to get 800k funding. NGK funding to split between staff members, you know, a hundred people on your on your roster is not a lot of money. When you especially when you put into, you know, you probably add up all the operational costs and stuff. It's just not a lot of money uh, for anybody that's actually worked in a small business or worked for a startup that's very fairly small. You would know how quickly um, staff salaries and just the operational costs in terms of having renting an office and all that stuff basically cost you. NGK definitely won't go too far. So I don't really know the history behind this or the background, but I would imagine there's probably more to it than just they got the funding and they said fuck off and took the money and went to flop in you know um Cote d'Ivoire or something I don't think that's what happened he said hey, are they still expecting us to play for free another one says wow here it is when soliciting UK government sites Borium said we've established careers of established artists like Honey Dijon JDG Forshay and I am Cheryl which they kind of have I won't say they've established it I don't see what they, why that's so like um crazy for them to say that. I don't think why is that so crazy for them to say they've. I don't think they've established, but they definitely did help to boost the careers of Honey D John for sure, J D G for sure, Forte Forte hundred percent, like hundred percent. You can't tell me Forte's career hasn't been helped greatly by his association or his ability to play on boardroom often. And Cheryl or Cheryl, however you pronounce her name, I am Cheryl. She definitely has um, benefit from it because she was a fairly. I won't say new, but not well-known DJ prior to that, you know, viral clip that went out of her. Of course, you don't want to be known for a viral clip like that, but still, you know, in terms of turning lemons into lemonade, that was definitely a really good occasion of that. I don't really see what's wrong with claiming, you know, you were able to boost people's careers. I think that's actually a good thing going forward. Um, it's a good. The next screenshot says incredible grift and shit housery. This is by a guy called Chris Duckenfield. Funding application protocol aside, we're talking about a ticket skimming um, enterprise masquerading as a cultural force and fucking a CCTV company run by aristocrat. Yeah, this is just some classes shit in it that I don't really understand. So 
does he have to be working class to run the boiler room? That's what people have to, I've wanted to say. I think people need to look at who really owns the record labels that most of these people are signed to or the clubs that they attend and they'll be in for a very, very big surprise. The CCTV comment is just a nonsense, really. Like, it's live streaming. Who, what, so what did you think? Did you think that um, when flipping, what's his name? what's his flipping name uh oh he tried to warn us before your phone and your instagram account and your facebook and your twitter do more damage than what cctv company could ever do trust me um they've got all your behavioral analytics and yeah you know, you know i mean already stored somewhere the amount of data that flipping facebook and, and whatnot have or data points they've been able to extract from you over the years are far far exceed some flipping cctv or some fucking gopro strapped to a desk somewhere in the middle of botswana like you need to chill um let's continue Da, 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 da. Emilio Snaz says, we all knew Boy Room was a shower of grift or shit, but it's nice to see it in writing. Hedge fund privileged kids will always do more damage to underground culture than they will help. Again, what do you want? What do you want? Because when Boy Room first died, everyone was trying to clamor to get an opportunity to go on there and play a set. No one cared who the founder was or where he came from background was. I don't necessarily see the point in even bringing it up. If that person who has these affluent links or is brought up in a lap of privilege is willing to kind of, you know, get in the muck, um, roll their sleeves up and provide opportunities for people who have no other means to do so, then why would you care? Do you know what I mean? The same thing happened with Radar Radio. Who was who founded that? That was Mike Ashley's son, right? The the owner of Flipping Newcastle United. Um, would you count him as an aristocrat or would you count him as somebody quite wealthy? I would say so. No one seemed to care when he had that station going on. No one even cared when the sexual harassment stuff was going on. People were willing to turn a blind eye about that because they were happy that they had a flipping morning radio show. You know what I mean? It's like, what are people even talking about with this stuff? I don't know. I really, really don't know. I like like what do you want do you want someone working class to go do it of course they'll go do it do you want support it because they haven't got any clout or they don't know anybody or they're not paying same situation happens again it's just bullshit really um another person says what's it other land says i don't get how some major venues got denied funding but boiler room and ra get creators grants from the uk smh yeah cool that's definitely a point i think this is definitely the best point the idea that Boiler Room and RA were able to get, I think another club too, there was, there was, a, there was I think a couple of clubs too that weren't able to get, I forgot what they were. But anyway, that's definitely a point, but that definitely goes to speak to more so to how the grants are dished out, um, the, the the inability or the ability to successfully know how to how to write an application, um, who to lobby for you, all those things I think play into it. I don't think it's generally just a thing of like, they read all the applications. It's definitely a bit of a gaming system. You have to take out the right people, have the right friends in the right places. That definitely does help. So that's maybe where where their aristocratic you know backgrounds come into it but for the most part it's just a game really if you can know how to game the system you can probably get the funding for your thing as well um you just know have to be willing to do it uh be brazen about it and grift and go and then obviously once you get the funding be able to kind of put it back into the places that matter but i don't necessarily think that's something to kind of knock them down for in my opinion but you know maybe i could be wrong maybe i could be wrong um but yeah let me know your comments and opinions actually in the comments what do you think do you think boiler room does more good than bad or more bad than good i generally tend to think it does more good than bad i generally do think it has provided a platform for people to kind of boost their career and to you know garner new audiences and to increase their dj fees and be able to play in festivals and shit i generally do think that's ha actually happened and i think for a dj especially myself included being on the kind of lower rungs and things you just want to play you don't care if you get paid if you don't get paid you just want to play out on a regular basis and if somebody's willing to pay you to play on a regular basis and you can increase your fee to pay on a regular basis i don't think you're going to care who fucking owns boiler room you don't care who owns it you don't care where it's situated if there's you know if they've got a sweatshop somewhere in the middle of china you won't give a shit you'll turn a blind eye because at the end of the day you're a dj and you like playing you like playing records for people in you know dark rooms dark arenas and making them dance and tap their feet and shit that's what you want to do so let's not kind of go around it any longer and for the punters you want to go rave you want to have a free experience maybe go and see people play you know under the guise of some you know new red bull drink or something whatever it may be but it's a fun night out it's free free entry at least you get to then pay for drinks at the bar you couldn't really ask for anything better than that really and for the people that have heard that work there behind the scenes they've seemed to enjoy it it's been a great place i'd imagine to get your cloud points up put that in your cv and then bounce with something else that you want to do, do you know what i mean so i think it helps most people that can use it or exploit it to their own need 
I think. But I think all this kind of finger wagging and pointing after the fact is a bit revisionist history. And now that people are a bit more, I don't know, it seems like woke or aware of these things. Now they're complaining, but I don't think this was this was ever hidden. I don't think people were in the know. I think most people in the know knew they they weren't paying, knew that it was kind of a bit of a grift or whatnot. But they were willing to turn a blind eye because the benefits far outweighed, um, you know, the negatives. I would imagine. But again, what do I know? Leave your comments down. The comments down below. I'd love to know what you think. What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? Sorry about that. I'm talking too much about this sort of stuff, but you know what? I love it. Um, talking about clubs and going out. Two our clubs and going out. I'm thinking this year, right? No, this year, this year. I'm thinking this year. The plan might be to go to Berlin to go, obviously, shock horror. <laughs> um, it might be to go to Berghain this year for New Year's Eve or for New Year's Day. That might be the plan because I remember this one article or review that I've kind of got up on the screen. I'm going to get up in a minute of their um, Club Silvestre, right, which is their kind of New Year's Day, free day banger of an event that usually starts on a Wednesday. It goes all the way until like Friday, no, Saturday morning. Yeah, sometimes, right? Absolutely insane level of raving that I really want to go to because I've never really done the free day in Bergheim anyway, where you go on like the Friday, Saturday, Sunday and you leave. No, actually, I have done it. Yeah, I have. What am I lying for? I, no, no, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't. I've done Saturday, Sunday, Monday, but I've never done the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday thing, which some people do. I, I don't think you could do Friday anyway because I'm, I'm sure... Bergheim opens up on a Saturday, so you have to do Panorama Bar from the Friday and then do this Bergheim from Saturday, Sunday, Monday. But still, I want to just do the New Year's, Eve, New Year's Day event. I've heard it's always amazing. The lineup is always flipping crazy. They do really good with the lineup because I think, obviously, they've got a huge roster of resident DJs, but I like that they kind of concentrate only on the residents for New Year's Day. They don't try to usually bring in any kind of external DJs to come and play, which is great because you definitely get more of a kind of club, no, kind of like a community centre, sort of like everyone knows each other feel and it definitely adds to the energy when you're in there i honestly do think that um it's been one of the most electric I, I, it's usually one of the most electric occasions when you go to panorama bar and there's loads of residents playing there and they're all hugging and high-fiving each other behind the decks it always kind of adds to the event i think overall so i definitely want to go do that for this year just to kind of be as a way to kind of mark the end hopefully of this fucking scourge of a pandemic that we're going through in a minute and just kind of personally celebrate you know being able to survive and kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel really all of it right and um again this is the power of things like resident advisor when it was at its pump this is an article published in 2020 or well, 2011 sorry in january which is called burger and sylvester um, and the, the writer here martin gold who's one of the better review better event reviews they had on there unfortunately he doesn't it seems like he works for resident advisor anymore i think the last article he published for them is like 2013 but he wrote this amazing um event review that they that i used to follow religiously back in the day when i'd go on all my kind of techno taunts and stuff and Horror stuff i always kind of check out some event reviews on there this is where i found out about robert johnson in frankfurt and a few other spots here and there but definitely a favorite of mine back in the day anyways the ra's event reviews and this event review for the Berghain nyd um celebrations is definitely up there some of the best so it says the following um this is any review of a party that lasts three days will necessarily omit some details i was there for almost 30 hours quite a marathon by normal standards but that still means i can't comment on more than half of what went down the panorama burger in this year i'm certain that there were countless tales and escapades that i missed out on but even without such details what i experienced at burger in total Sylvester 2020 10 was utterly outstanding um opting for what i thought was an early arrival i was greeted by an already booming main room as ben clock drove his way through his distinctive sparse fierce techno playfully into interwined with haunting echoes of underground house pulling records from the box and quite literally spanned decades yet sounded consistently and thoroughly now close relentlessly precise mixing held together a diverse ever-evolving tour through the darkest corners of electronic music upstairs in Panama bar prosumer reminded everyone that they were here to tap party bouncy bassy house set the tone for much of the weekend ahead when out and out anthems such as style councils the promised land caught everybody off guard even the quarters of panorama bars con congression jumped headfirst into the sweaty sea of grins surrounding the dj booth and you just read that right the opening couple of paragraphs and you're like you know what i need to go eventually so i need and again this is the power of words the power of these flipping event reviews is that there's no pictures you're just visualizing this stuff and usually for the most part i think 
yeah, because I first went in 2010. But sometimes you're just reading this without knowing what this club looks like. You're just kind of imagining it and hoping you replicate the feeling that that review gave you when you actually go yourself. And usually nine times out of 10, it definitely ends up being far better than the review you actually read um, prior to going. And then I think one of the best standout bits was this, Kurt about Dixon, right? And I think this might have been one of the first acknowledgements of how sick of a DJ was and also kind of another um, indication of where he was kind of heading in terms of his stardom. It is in 2010. So it says, yeah, um, start session two, because I think obviously the guy went back and came back again, which is what I plan to do. I'm planning when I do go to three days, I'm planning to like do free outfit changes, go to wherever Airbnb or wherever I end up staying, wash, shower, change, or maybe have a bit of a kip, wake up sprightly, put a new outfit on, head back in, do the same thing. I mean, I want to just, I want to proper enjoy the event and kind of really go out and show out and turn it into an actual party, do you know what I mean, all the way through a celebration. And now that I'm in a space where I don't need to go out and get absolutely wrecked every time to have a good time, I know that I can just do that for the first couple of sessions and then maybe get on on the third or just kind of see how it goes and play it by ear. But I'm not really pressed to kind of go straight in and kind of go straight, head straight to the loose. I can still kind of simmer in. So this is the following. Um, Let's continue here. So it says, oh, and from this twisty um, Twilight emerged Dixon playing a challenging set that was my personal highlight of the whole weekend. A clear and sharp contrast from the harder, rougher house that Sumo had opted for, Dixon delved into the immovable shades of electronic spectrum while always remaining true to the unmistakable Innovision spirit. The progression from the timeless selections such as SSU um, to, towards um, hard, deeper house seemed organic and natural as tensions and arms soared skyward. With the final trace of the room's dignity um, running dangerously thin, David August moving, they finally pushed things over the edge and there were hugs and there were happy New Year's and there were cheers like the World Cup winning goal and there was a party and indeed the club at its finest. Moments like this simply do not happen outside of a panorama bar. Dixon called upon thoughtful house tinge electronica to bring this set to a close, handing over to Steffi amidst rapturous applause. That might be one of the best kind of recommendations you could ever find for a DJ that you might want to go see. The best, right? The best, legitimately the best. And that might, again, might have been an indication of where this guy was heading. Because since then, it's been just one, I mean, steep, steep, steep incline. Um, He's definitely been going up towards that. So I see that, I read that. I look at the lineup in 20, the last lineup they did, the last club notch. So the last club, Sylvester, was in 2020, obviously the beginning of the beginning of last year, uh, which was just a couple of, yeah, a few months before I went, because I went, I think, in February. And this lineup is, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty tough, right? And again, as you can see, it's split over the three days, kind of roughly. You got this Muscle Demon, Answer Code Request, Terence Fixma, um, Face Face Hal, Baker, Fidel, Boris, and then Dr. Rubenstein all closing out the first. And that's the first night only in Pergine. And then it continues on to the second night, the Thursday, I'm assuming. Let's get it over there. Freddie K, Volvox, Samwen, Norman Nodge, um, Ed. F. Dimi, F. Dimin, how you pronounce that? Kobolsi, Len Faki, Luke Slater, and then to close out um the, the well to close to to close out the night is Berghain. You got Etap Kyle playing there from two a.m. and then you've got the following again. So you see how it kind of breaks down. But look at the lineup, man. Paramount Bar lineup is nice. Francois K. Steffi. Roy Perez, Jennifer Cardini, Ryan Elliott. Ryan Elliott was always a bit of a I don't know much today. It's just kind of. Demeanor, demeanor, but I bumped into him once with somebody when I was in the Burkhine on Paramount Bar, and he did come off a bit standoffish, a little bit like up his own ass. But I get it. You know I mean, you're you, you're a flipping Burkhine Paramount Bar resident. Um, you play sick tunes. You've been in the game for a while. You moved over from the states to Berlin, and you settled and made a life yourself. So that gas can exist. But he was a little bit up his own ass. You could definitely tell. Um, then you got Nick Hopner there, Virginia God Jansen, of course, who I'm a big fan of, Avalon Emerson, Massim. Massimiliano Pagliaria, who's actually playing this weekend, I think. Is it this weekend or is it next weekend? I think in a couple of weeks at Fold for, um, um, what's it called? The King Party, a uh, crossbreed. I'm pretty sure. I definitely remember seeing his name. Cormac here playing. I don't know what the XSX floor. I've never been there. Maybe that's another room they opened up. See, because they opened up a lot of other rooms. So they've got the, whatever, however you pronounce that, salon. You've got the XSX floor. Maybe that might be the. What's the other? What's the other gay bar they've got downstairs? Like in the basement. What's it called? the uh, laboratory right or something that might be where the, these guys are playing you got Cormac, Skatebad, Chris Cruz, Soundstream, 
Sam Shim is always brilliant in Burger and Param- in Paramount Bar for the most part. Castro, Nemo, back to back, Paramita, Midland. And then you've got Salon, you've got loads of live acts playing more so in Salon and stuff. But definitely, honestly, one of the far better nights to go to. And allegedly, the rumor is, according to people in the know, um, indoors because obviously you can rave indoors now in berlin for the most part or in germany overall um i think the cap now is i think 2000 and you have to kind of initiate some um, air conditioning thing that they've got going on in clubs if you want to get it higher or something i don't know what the exact specifics are but regardless um most or well, some clubs who have who have the ability to are going to reopen of course the only problem is that to go to these clubs you have to obviously have a vaccine they're not permitting people to do like lateral photos or pcr tests you have to be double vaxxed and have the covid pass to in order to end to get entry into any clubs um but supposedly um i've heard the rumor is that Berghain is going to open up indoors in October. So from October 1st, they're going to be, you know, doing their programming that way indoors. That's only a rumor. I don't know if it's true. Um, if you check out their programming now, they're only showing stuff for the club garden at the moment, which if I'm not mistaken, holds about 500 people. I don't know. Last time I went there, it did look about a 500 person kind of venue. But for the most part, it's just, um, it's just uh, the club the club garden now for the most part that you're seeing right now and um, they haven't really listened to anything else for any other month so maybe by the end of the month we'll, or the middle of the month we'll see what the program is for october and we'll get a better idea of what they're kind of doing but i've allegedly have been told october is definitely the month that they're going to reopen up indoors so and seeing as october is going to be uh, sober october for me in terms of doing the challenge that they do with um what's his face with Joe Rogan and them, man, I'm definitely going to try and head of head to go. I'm definitely going to try and look to go um, the beginning of November. If not, I'll just hold out and try and go for the New Year's Eve at the beginning of January and just bang out and do the entire three days and see how I feel, man. It's going to be an absolute wild ride, but I'm definitely looking forward to going it because I've got a pep back into my step. That one is for sure. Well, let's continue on. Let's go, 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 go. What's I to talk about here with you today? What's I to talk about here with you today? Uh, we talk about that. We talk about boiler room. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, let's go like this. Let's do this one. So this is um again touching on that kind of tragic story that happened a couple of days ago or a few days ago actually um regarding some la comics that were unfortunately you know got into a bit of bother over the weekend went back to somebody's home were doing a couple of lines of coke and unfortunately the coke had been laced with fentanyl and the three people ended up passing away one person is still in hospital who happens to be kate quigley who's obviously associated with um joey diaz and it's somebody that i think joey diaz brought out I think it's gone on tour with her and it's used as an opener. She's just like an OG from the church that's happening. What's now, if you're plugged in with the LA comedy scene, you definitely have seen her around. And um, she's kind of hopefully on the way to recovery, but still a tragic story nonetheless. And this is courtesy of Los Angeles Times. It says, LA comedians mourn death of fellow comics Faquan Johnson and Enrico Ca- Colangini. Colangini? Colangeli, sorry. Enrico Colangeli. Um, so it said the following laughter and was hushed at the Haar Comedy Club in North Hollywood over Labor Day weekend as comics and fans mourned the death of two beloved funny men whose absence on stage was felt even as their names glowed in memoriam surrounded by the golden lights. Fuquan Johnson and Enrico Coglanilli were found dead early Saturday at the home of Venice Beach um, of the overdosing reportedly on fentanyl laced cocaine. Also declared dead at the scene according to reports with Natalie Williamson while comedian and model Kate Quigley 39 was taken hospital. Quigley later responded as she was doing okay and better to recover. Jack Amistar, Jack um, Asadorian Jr., a friend who had seen Johnson, Kirkland, and quickly at the ha just days before, said he woke up to a text one morning and breaking the news. He says, I thought it was a sick joke. We're all comedians, so we do some dark jokes before, but this is just like the worst joke ever. The deaths of Johnson and Colangeli dealt a devastating blow to local and superstar comics alike who knew the pair and watched them grow. After years of hustling from open mic spots at the ha the their best friends had in recent years taken their careers to the next level. Both were doing cross country shows and Johnson had previously worked as a writer and comedian on TV series Comedy Parlor Live. The loss of two entertainers known better as Fu and Rico um, embodied the journey of the struggle of success. Fu started from the bottom, he said he do, he could do open mics, just also always working for his craft and always getting funnier, said Jack Jr. Jack Jr. met Johnson in 2019 while working as a bartender at his parents' club, the Ha Ha. Johnson had just moved to New Jersey to become a comic. Unlike most of the comics, Johnson had arrived um, with bona fide uh, 
friends with like Kevin Hart and other major comedians. Johnson would eventually tour as an opener for Sean and Marlon Wayans, but only after the boisterous Rhapsody voice comedian worked hard doing innumerable open mics and small gigs. He said, Fu was a, so Fu was a Wayans, said T producer and writer Craig Wayans, but he worked his way from the ground up. He earned his name in the comedy stories. A lot of people came out here and became comics. He came out here to be a comic. Like Johnson, Colin and Jelly left a solid middle class upbringing to pursue his craft as a comedian, um, doing whatever it would take to get on a scene. Jack Jr. remembers his father telling him how Colin and Jelly would sit outside a club before he opened reading a book as he waited to speak with somebody about getting an opportunity to be on stage. Jack Jr.'s father gave them one of the comic his spot at first by carrying crates of water into the club, then by doing odd jobs, including the time on the task of working the door to earn his stage privileges. One night he was working the door at the club and Jack Jr. said, and I walked in with two girls and my dad always said, charge everyone that comes to the door. So I'm walking in and then Rico stops me and says, hey, it's $20 to come in. And I laughed and said, you got the job. After that, we became friends right away. <sighs> tragic, and I don't, I don't know, man. Not read the whole thing, but it's just tragic because obviously tragic because of the deaths of the people but you also kind of figure to yourself like just this this epidemic that's going on at the moment now in the states with fentanyl less drugs it's just too crazy man it's just insane i understand it from the point of view of like you know pure business and economics if you're looking to increase your yield and you're looking to increase your profit margins being able to cut your coke with something that increases the hit makes the hit stronger but also doesn't take away from the product or make it gunky like you know cutting it with like a benzo or was that whatever that's called right um i get that point of it but the risk and reward um definitely just it doesn't make any sense especially if you're a cartel especially if you're the people that are kind of taking it from the source and then supplying it to the you know to the people that run the streets and shit because that's what people are saying the the, the rumors or the stories out there is that supposedly this fent is either being cut into the coke at its point of manufacture or the other thing the other theory is that supposedly the same places that are cut that are making coke or that are distributing it um and then selling to people on the street are also the same places where they're storing fentanyl and there's some cross contamination going there but i don't think that's true i think it's most likely the first because fentanyl is really cheap and because it's a far better cut than a benzo because it doesn't damage the product the overall product of the, the overall product I don't know effect or whatnot. Do you know what I mean? People are willing to do that, but so far the 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 negatives is that if you got if you get like a strong concentration of fent in your coke and you're just unlucky and it's too much concentrated or whatnot or whatever it may be or hasn't been cut properly. I don't know. The consequences are really 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 fatal. Like you basically die. There is no middle ground, or you get to a point where you never really fully recover. Right? You have these kind of long lasting um, illnesses and whatnot. And it's just sad, man. It really, really is sad. And part of me thinks that, and another part of me thinks maybe because it's such a taboo around talking talking about in general people doing coke, because it seems like for the most part, especially in LA or especially in entertainment circles or just scenes everywhere, there's definitely a wide contingent or a big contingency of people doing gear, right? And no one wants to admit it for whatever reason. And maybe that kind of leads to people kind of doing stuff in hiding, not telling people where they're getting their stuff, which then leads to people, which then leads to shady dealers explain the situation. Do you know what I mean? Um, because they know no one talks to each other about where they get their stuff or they hide where they what they use and whatnot. It's just really, it's just a bizarre place to be in, really. Um, but just sad nonetheless. Do you know what I mean? Free friends. Um, you know, having a night out, enjoying themselves, decide to buy some grab a Coke or whatnot and split between them, having a couple of drinks. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But then for that to turn into what it turned into is just really, really sad. And maybe you're even sadder because of their ages, do you know what I mean? Like they're not like young whippersnappers who are just kind of having too much fun. They're obviously people that are like, you know, fully grown. They're coming into a bit of a career and this legitimately might have been a one-off because there are those people that exist who just do coke or they just get high on weed and stuff on the weekends right they have a long week at work monday to friday and just you know what? i need to unwind i need to kind of let go of the week and kind of you know roll into the weekend you know with a clear head and not thinking about work and whatnot so you just get a bit buzzed and i don't think there's anything wrong with that especially if you can keep it in moderation and not kind of go too crazy what, what's wrong with doing such a thing i didn't really understood but when your gear is being laced with such dangerous chemicals and drugs and shit, it just makes doing such a thing so much more difficult and dangerous. Jeremy, you're really putting your life at risk by doing it. You really, really are. And I don't know, I just hope people take more 
you know, care in their drug taking over there in the States. People just don't go too crazy um, and just try and help each other and try and be as helpful as you can to your friends and family. Share where you're getting your stuff from, who's selling bonk gear. Don't be afraid to call them out. All those things need to be done so we can get to a far better place. But uh, yeah, RIP those that passed away, Fukon Johnson, Enrico Colangeli, and is it Kate Williamson? Let me double check that. Um, yeah, Nat Natalie Williamson, sorry. And obviously, get well soon, Kate Quigley, man. We definitely don't want to see those kind of things. Man. It's one of the most upsetting stories I've seen in a while. Not going to lie. Super, super upsetting. <sighs> um, moving on from that one. Sorry about that one. Mm, let's talk about this. So it's some hype beast, actually. Um, it looks like Sally Bembry has released another leak another i i sneak peek at his up and coming new balance collaboration and it looks absolutely banging and it made me think yeah it made me think something that i've been ruminating on my own a little bit was it maybe unwise to given the new balance creative director role for the usa right new balance usa creative director role to the ami leondo guy wouldn't, wouldn't a far better choice for that creative director role would have been somebody like a salil Bembry? Or is that your pencil name? Salil? Salihi? Salihi? Salihi, probably. Salihi or Salihi. I don't know. Mr. Bembry. Do you think it would have been a far better choice to give this creative director role of New Balance USA to someone like Mr. Bembry? Especially when you consider the amount of hits that he's had with these um, New Balance shoes so far. One, two, three, back to back to back. Absolute bangers. And then he comes with this. That was absolutely fantastic, right? It's kind of like, it's like he's upgraded and brought into, you know, modern life, a very classic New Balance shape and updated it with some crazy new bits of tech and, you know, whatever it may be on the midsole. I don't know. Maybe there's an argument for it. But it says the following on Hypebeast. It says after dropping the water... Uh, sorry, Water Be The Guy 20, 2000R or 200R, sorry, in June. Um, Benbury has taken to Instagram to reveal the first look at his fourth collaboration with New Balance, a suede grey take on the brand's classic 574 model. So it's the classic 574 that's been upgraded or basically brought into um, the modern age. They've obviously done something to the midsole. They've changed some panelling here on the toe box, it looks like. Obviously, the colour, the shape, the tongue's different as well but it looks absolutely banging here. Um, upon the glance, it's evident that the new silhouette veers away from the vibrancy of the Benbury's past collaborations from a technical perspective. The shoe's upper construction employs mesh and suede. We know that also ident unidentical, so unidentified whistle-like component extends from the back of the upper. What's a whistle? Is a whistle? What's a whistle? Oh, this thing here. Okay, so maybe you can pump it with your mouth or something. Oh, interesting. Maybe. I don't really know. That'd be interesting. Or maybe you could put some water in the back of your heels and drink out your uh, drink out of your shoe. Do, do you could basically do a shoey without having to do a shoey. Um, the tongue's front lacing system reads URT five seven four, confirming the shoe's signature lineage and hinting at the official name. Okay, for for sure you know what's gonna happen, right? Oh look at that! Yeah, that's the kind of it looks, it looks like a I don't know. It looks like you could either suck it or you can pump it, right? Absorb CBSS on the other side. I don't really know what's going on there, but they look absolutely banging. Um, at the time of writing, release day and pricing information is yet to be released, but we're going to get more soon. But yeah, these look absolutely banging. Benbury absolutely went ham on these, man. They look fucking amazing. So yeah, I don't know, man. Maybe I'm in the minority here, but I think maybe he should have got the creative director role at New Balance first, and then you give it to Emilion Dor second, especially when you're considering what we've seen so far from um, Emilion Dor when it comes to MB collaborations. They're getting a little bit boring, right? I love the guys. I think clothing-wise, they're in a league of their own, but the collaborations with New Balance aren't really hitting the way they should be hitting. They kind of remind me a little bit of what Kiff were doing back in the day. They had a couple of standouts and then they slowly but surely veered off the side of a cliff in terms of, you know, boring conformity, sort of like, you know, playing to the hits and to the favourites. It got a little bit boring and safe. But, you know, for the, what we've seen so far, Benbury definitely, from what he did, the, yeah, from the third pair to this, like, do you know what I mean? Like, from the colours to the, exp like, everything, he's definitely gone completely opposite and tried to do something a little bit more monotone, a little bit less flash flashing in your face and then suddenly now look at it just look at that shoe man absolutely banging it really really is banging update look at the 574 hopefully we get an update look of it soon official date soon it'll definitely sell out and all that malarkey you probably won't be to get a pair but it's fun to discuss nonetheless we've done that so it's hey fever my thing and that's so nasty doing that but hey i have to to survive 
And then in more footwear news, courtesy of uh, Profs on Instagram, we've got these. We've got a look at these, at these. Morel, 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 Hydro Mox, right? And um, again, these this type of silhouette, maybe again taking inspiration from the, what do you call it? From the Yeezy Foam Runners. Um, or maybe from, you know, from like a, what, what's, the, what's the sandals called that everyone's wearing at the moment? You know, the sandals that all the cooks wear and shit, right? Maybe that's where it's coming from. But I'm I'm liking this alternative sort of like approach, um, unconventional approach to like footwear, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be a trainer or a slide. It's sort of like an in-between thing. I quite like it. It definitely makes wearing shoes or footwear a little bit more interesting. It offers up different solutions, different kind of options for the wardrobe, um, diversifies it somewhat. Um, and just gives a brand the ability to maybe try new things with these kind of models without worrying if it's going to cut, take a cut out of their main line or worrying if it's just going to be too much of a flop that people are going to run away from it. Because if anything, this is sort of like a version of men. It's a, it's a version for, it's a kind of the men's version of wearing really ugly shoes that girls are wearing maybe a couple of years ago, right? Where girls are wearing really terrible shoes and purposely horrible outfits and stuff like kind of, you know, quintessential man repair lusties. Um, now we're in the stage or point of view where guys are purposely dressing for other dudes right you're not really wearing these things and trying to go pull at jaguar shoes in it you're it's unlikely you're definitely wearing these to kind of you know give uh to make sure the heads know make sure the guys that you're bumping into a good hood can kind of give you a head nod because they know you've kind of cuffed them right you've got the right socks or maybe no socks in them you kind of made them just look as, as they should need to look and i like it i like this approach honestly it kind of i like the idea that dudes are kind of going out there dressing for themselves or for other dudes um to kind of impress them i think that's fairly good because you know it, as a byproduct of looking cool and being somebody that people want to talk to in front of other dudes you that should help you in terms of pulling women it really should of course if you're interested if you're not then you know you're going to be always happy with the interest you're going to get from guys anyway, regardless but still i like it i'm not gonna lie um and obviously they've done an iteration of the hydro mug and decided to do these kind of pastel um marbly kind of uppers which look absolutely brilliant i'm not going to i'm not going to lie i'm not going to kid you i've never actually wore a hydro mug so i don't know if you could actually um flatten this so you can wear it more back strapless or if that comes over and then you can wear it more a bit strapless that way but either i love the construction and the look of it and then we've got like a slide which i'm not really the biggest fan of i quite like this um sort of like fully encapsulated model more so than the actual strap slide itself but still looks really amazing um can't wait to see it hopefully drop soon supposedly he's saying yes yeah, soon come so hopefully we get it very very soon but i like it man i like these ugly shoes that dudes are wearing nowadays i think this is the this is the right way this is the correct way for me definitely the correct way for me um we got that we got this what else we talk about we haven't talked about a lot more things haven't we um let's move on to this one uh la, la, la. yeah this is courtesy of mix mag let's put this up on the screen before we duck out it says berlin may introduce vaccinated only public venues unvaccinated people may face tougher restrictions we're not really too surprised by this i think we've heard this news you know out there for a while because the the thinking was when the clubs did reopen the only way that they could reopen safely was to only allow people who've had double jab to obviously to go into them but it could be argued that there is no guarantee being double vaccinated that you're not going to get covid and the pcr test on top of the double vaccinations was probably a far better way to go because to ensure that at least people were for the last 24 hours not you know um, positive for covid that was probably the better way to go about things but i don't really know why they decided not to do that but regardless it says here berlin may be heading towards tougher restrictions it said senator of economic affairs romano pop speaking that the other senator said the trend is heading in this direction we're already seeing lawsuits and shouldn't rather make for regulations themselves than let people drift um those who have depended on negative lateral flow tests and not vaccinations and natural immunity would face tougher restrictions potentially being barred from restaurants and other public areas those who have been vaccinated or who have natural immunity would have not to prove this gain entry under the 2g restrictions being proposed so the interesting thing about it is all in a lateral flow test like i don't mind it i think it's a bit of a protocol and a weird thing you have to get used to before you go out you just kind of you know i'm lucky because i ordered about seven packs i've used about two or three already so maybe i've got to reorder some more and i'm sure there'll come a point where the pcr lateral flow test will not be free anymore there'll probably be some sort of nominal fee i'm okay with that so you have to get used to doing that as a sort of like process but 
something about me tells me that they're not as like legit accurate as they should be because I've been doing them at home and I don't really have a great gag reflexes. So whenever I'm trying to kind of swab my tonsils, I kind of gag really quickly. I don't really do it too long. And of course, doing the nose is not too big of an issue. But because of that, I never really think I'm getting, I should be, I'm, I usually think I'm either getting too much bogey or I'm not getting enough saliva or whatever at the back of my tonsils. So then, but then when I test myself, I always come up negative. I'm, it doesn't come up inconclusive or whatever. It's always negative so maybe i'm doing it right but something tells me i'm not do you know what i mean so maybe it can be gamed or it can be twanged in a way so it could be argued for those people who are saying that oh they should let you do lateral flow tests so you can go to a club but maybe they could argue and say you know lateral flow tests aren't guaranteed way of you showing that you're actually negative with covid maybe the only way to actually generally show you with a closer to 90 percent you know success rate or approval rate would be to do a pcr test but those cost money i mean those ones in the uk for the most part the cheapest i've seen around is like 100 quid and you have to kind of go to a clinic that might be a bit far out of the way so that's a bit of an odd one it continues to said hamburg implemented the restrictions at the later end of um august with unvaccinated people being barred from public venues at the owner's discretion on uh, this first weekend many of the bars in hamburg adopted the 2g restrictions to increase the capacity the rules are already present in clubbing in berlin if 2g restrictions have brought in to cross the land curfews may be dropped and signaling a return to 24 7 nightlife of vaccinated people speaking in berlin uh, thomas head yeah, da, da, da. So, no, sorry freedom of choice is, is by far the best solution there's no unanimous option among us. Social distancing regulations reduce every restaurant capacity by 30%. But on the other hand, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that 2G will really bring people into the restaurants. While others are worried the restrictions would be unnecessarily harsh to those um, vaccinated with non-EU vaccines, young people and those who are in, in compromised and pregnant. But yeah, there's no guarantee these things are going to work and going to save people, but they basically have to do something in it in order to survive, in order to reopen, in order to show they're playing ball with the government. But it just must be interesting place to be in to be in a place like berlin so forward thinking so anti-establishment so against the grain so questioning of you know government's um control and things and influence to be at a place where you're now kind of acquiescing and saying you know what i'll put my hands up i give up i'll get the vaccine passport because i just need to rave i just need to do care in a fucking dark club somewhere in the middle of fucking you know noi clones or whatever it may be right i just need to do it i can't be, be sitting at home alone anymore i just have to kind of get out so you're willing to give up your your i guess your principles your morals the way you look at life your ideals in order for you to dance that is the sacrifice that we're doing and unfortunately everyone does that it's not like a bad thing but we're all kind of faced with that reality that we're kind of having to do these things that we probably would have never done many years gone by but you know things have changed things have changed um then we've got this crazy story coach of mixed mag again about pretty patel wanting to ban um nitrous oxide use this might be the this might be the point where her and skepta end up breaking up because i know skepta's got a thing for pretty but this one might be where skepta kind of breaks up with her because if she's going to be banning nitrous oxide i don't think those boys are going to be happy about it it says here pretty has announced a new crackdown on nitrous oxide calling for a review into the effects of the drugs popular amongst 16 to 24 year olds with more than 500,000 people from age of groups um reporting that they took the drug in 2019 nitrous oxide accessibility and cheap price may be incredibly popular amongst young people i know when i was that age i'm never going to answer a survey so if they're getting 500,000 people to admit that they took nitrous oxide from that group imagine people that haven't admitted to it it must be the millions because you know you go to any kind of hip area in london after the hours of like a midnight you're definitely going to see canisters all over the street you know what i mean people are getting it in with these canisters um patel speaking about the use of nitrous oxide said that the tougher action would be taken on the usage calling the independent advisory council and the misuse of drugs to investigate its effects this could lead to a discrimination of nitrous oxide possession allowing substances to potentially fall into the same category as cannabis they're trying to class nitrous oxide balloons as the same as flipping smoking weed are you insane and um, nitrous oxide is widely available due, uh, online due to being used for whipped cream production the suppliers often warn that inhaling the gas is illegal and under legal legislation created in 2016 supply of the substance for inhalation is illegal yeah so that's why a lot of people that i've seen who kind of use it or kind of sell it they'll have like they'll have the components of the whole thing split between three people so one person has the pump one person has the balloon one, you know i mean and then so if you ever get nabbed you just say you got that one thing that person got the other thing so they can't say that you were kind of illegally trying to distribute or whatever you know what i mean but i still think it's flipping stupid um 
Many are opposed to the move from Patel, um, saying that it plays into the wider patterns of unnecessary punitive damages or drug story measures. Speaking about that in a new review, Boku Boriesk, um, head of the policy of the Royal Society of the Public Health, said the government insistence on criminalization and incarnation, incarcerate, incarceration sorry, for minor drug offences worsens problems linked to illicit drug use, including social inequality and violence. He continued and said the heavy-handed enforcement approach to drugs does nothing but spread fear among young people prevent them from seeking the support they need and necessarily drags unnecessarily drags them into the criminal justice system there are concerns of criminalization that could push large numbers of young people into the criminal justice system and hinder opportunities and employment while home office has spoken of the widespread littering misusing drugs can also have a devastating effect on lives and communities we are determined to do all we can to address this issue and protect the futures of our children and young people you're not protecting the fish the futures of our children and young people because they clearly want to do balloons that that's how their futures are looking. They want to do balloons. They want to hang out with their friends and you're preventing them from doing so. It's just so boring, isn't it? Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't really get the kind of this thing. The the balloon hide lasts for what? Ten, like a minute, if less than that. Um, how they compare the both is just absolutely bizarre to me. Um, it just doesn't make any sense at all. But it wouldn't surprise me if this issue is basically being brought about because of some Tory MP somewhere, right, who kind of maybe or some, you know, donor or whatever who gets annoyed because their street is being filled with all these little cancers on the on the side of the curb and whatnot. And they probably had a bit of a call, put in a couple of favours and were able to basically bring this to a point where Priti Patel is considering making them illegal. Because that's what happened with rave culture, isn't it? I remember I read the article on this podcast before. Supposedly the whole reason why Margaret Thatcher got such a bono in terms of banning acid rave parties and whatnot around the you know, around many fields in the UK was that some MP or someone complained that their farm was getting ransacked by all these random kids that were turning up and playing this music and leaving it into leaving it the next day looking like a pigsty that they put in the word and then, you know, overnight some really draconian laws came into place to prevent the mass gathering of people in these places. I mean just crazy shit but it all stemmed because of one guy one mp you know getting getting hot and hot under the collar about these kids hanging around and having too much fun i don't necessarily get it i really really don't but you know these people are weird man these people are weird oh sorry about that. my freaking thing is hurting isn't it? Oh, my fever's on another level anyway i think i might be you know I think we'll leave it there for the excellent thing show episode number four and so four is it four? Yeah, four nine two. Thanks so much for tuning in as per you. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's the first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends. And as per usual, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Take care, be safe, and peace. <laughs>